Okay, you're on. I'll oh, praise the Lord.
second coming of Jerusalem. We find it talked about in the New Testament, but we got it through the Old Testament too. Uh, as we talked last time, we got 404 verses in the book of Revelation. Uh, some scholars say 248, some say 500, but if you really break it down, there's over 800 references in this book. Over 800 Old Testament references. It is chock full of Old Testament. Now, here's the thing about John. John wrote this book to the seven churches, and those seven churches were full of saved Jews who had a working knowledge of the Old Testament to grow up with. So they could understand some of it, not all of it. But now that we have an indwelling Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is my teacher and guide. Dr. Rosen is not your teacher and guide. The Holy Spirit is my teacher and guide and your teacher and guide. He'll teach me. I can only go so far. Number three, keep a journal. When you're studying this book, you should keep a journal anyways, a personal journal. If you come into a portion of scripture and like, uh, um, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, if I don't understand that, I'm going to write it down in a journal. And I'm going to start praying, Lord, Reveal to me the truth of this for myself, for the church, and for the unbeliever. And how it works. And you keep praying. And the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you. Eventually, He will. If we keep praying and asking Him, He promises He'll give us an answer. Ten years down the road, you're going to be studying this book. If you put your notes in this book, Ten years down the road, you're going to see how the Holy Spirit worked in you to reveal to you things and how you stepped up to the next level and the next level and the next level in understanding this book. The deeper we understand the book of Revelation, the more intimate we become with the Trinity. And by the way, I'm a Trinitarian. I believe in Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which you're going to see here in a second. People say, well, I don't believe in the Trinity. Well, once we see a few things, you're going to have a hard time substantiating that thing. So, uh, so it is healthy to keep a journal. But write in your Bible. Don't worry about how your Bible looks. Work it to death. Because this is, a, this is your handbook. If you have to come into contact with somebody, and you have all your notes, and you leave them at home, and you have your Bible with you, you can't say, oh, you know what? I gotta go home and get my notes. And then we can sit down and talk. This may be the moment for them. And God intersected your life with theirs in order to bring them to the cross. You'll have it in your Bible. You don't have to go home and look for your notes. If you can find your notes, it may be too late. You wanna get them while the fire is hot. So let's take a look. We went through the first three verses and we saw the triad there. Let's go to verse 4 and take a look at John. John, I want to stop right there for a second. Let's talk about John just for a second. John, James, Andrew, they were together with Zebedee. They had a lucrative fishing business. They had servants. And one day, John met up with Yeshua with Jesus. And he told his dad, I'm leaving. I'm following that guy there. But the Holy Spirit was in the midst of it. And Zebedee was okay with that. But John was, he was the apostle of love. But he was also called one of the sons of thunder. This is the guy that told Jesus about Samaria. Let's call fire down and burn them all up. Do you see the apostle of love in that sentence? But John was transformed by Jesus. Now John believed to be a disciple of John the Baptist. The Apostle John. And he had connections too. We find little portions of scripture in the New Testament where he had connections with the high priest. He had connections with Nicodemus. So he was just not any guy. He had connections. But that didn't keep him from being the Apostle. 
two ways you can find out if somebody is going to change when they become a Christian. You give them money, and you give them power, and you give them fluency, and see what happens. They change. I got a question for Christianity. So, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, and this was Asia Minor, and this was probably the area which we call modern Turkey. There were a lot of other churches around. What about the church in Rome? What about the church in Jerusalem? But these seven churches just happened to be, and we'll find this later on down the road, to be a representation of dispensations in the, in the church period. And we're going to see that as we go later on down the road. But these were seven churches. Why these seven? We don't know. This is what what the Lord picked, these seven churches. And John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, most believers that read this thing will say Jesus, but it's not Jesus. Let me read it to you again. Grace to you and peace. That little phrase right there, you cannot have peace unless you have grace first. It doesn't say peace and grace to you. It says grace and peace. Grace produces peace. The grace of God produces the peace of God. And peace with God. If you're peaceful, you don't experience grace. You've got to have grace first. And it's very specific. Grace and peace to you. From him who is, and who was, and who is to come. This little phrase right here, in the middle of this phrase, it's, uh, now, I told you we're going to get some Hebrew and some Greek. And it's oin, oon, oerkominos. This middle phrase, uh, literally, it is the one who is, the was. Well, that was in Greek is actually I am. The I am. The one who is, the I am, and the one coming. Now we think that that's Jesus and the Perusia coming second, but look how senseless that would be because the next verse says, it says, who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and ruler over the kings of the earth. Let's stop right there. This is a whole, this is a whole sermon right here, these couple little verses. The first part of this verse speaks of God the Father, the I Am. Old Testament, the I Am that I Am. Ehiyah, Asher Ehiyah, in Hebrew. Ehiyah, Asher Ehiyah. That means I am who I am. Or I am who I will be. So the first part of this verse says, from the Father. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne. There are those who think, well, there are seven spirits. No, there's only one. This is the Holy Spirit. This is in Greek, it's called pneuma, the breath. When you have pneumonia, pneuma is breath, lack of breath. This, there isn't a seven spirits of God. We're going to take a look at these seven spirits. It's the sevenfold Spirit of God, the sevenfold ministry of God, which we're going to take a look in Isaiah chapter 11. Oh, Old Testament again, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. We're going to see who the sevenfold spirit is and what it's all about. And from Jesus Christ. Now, watch now how it's set up. Here's the pattern. Here's a code. We're looking at codes now, and we're going to break them. And from Jesus Christ, Isu Christos in Greek. The faithful witness. Jesus was the faithful witness in his life. During his life, he witnessed. He was the faithful witness. He never backed down, no matter what. The firstborn from the dead. What is firstborn from the dead? That would be resurrection. His resurrection. He was the firstborn from the dead. First Corinthians uh, chapter 15 is called the doctrine of the resurrection, and we see it in there. 
Though so far we see his faithful witness, his life, the firstborn from the dead, his resurrection, death and resurrection, and ruler over the kings of the earth, ascension, and sitting on the right hand of God the Father. Life, death, resurrection, ascension. See the pattern? See the code? That's code. We were able to break the code. It's right there. And remember now, this first chapter is the revelation of the one who is sitting on the throne now, on the right hand of God the Father. The throne hasn't been given to him yet. He's going to get the throne here shortly in a few chapters. The Father will give the Son the throne in his existence. But right here in the first chapter, we're, be, we're being given revelation of who he is and we have the codes that we can break in order to understand the depth, the height, the width of Jesus Christ and who he is in heaven. We got pictures that hang on the wall. That's about as close as we can get until you get to this book. But once you can start breaking the codes, now it's a panoramic movie of Jesus in heaven. Not just Jesus, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have the Trinity here. People have told me, well, I don't believe in a Trinity. Well, let's see. I've got the Father here in the first part, graced you in peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And then I've got the sevenfold Spirit, and that's Numa, that's the Holy Spirit. And then I've got, and from Jesus Christ, and that is Jesus. So I've got the Son, I've got the Holy Spirit, and I've got the Father. What's your problem? Why are you telling me there's not a Trinity? No. If you really want to get down to brass tacks, I'm, I'm not going to go here. I'm going to take you all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 in the Old Testament, all the way to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God, that is the Father, created the heaven and the earth. Not the heaven, the heaven and the earth. And the earth was unformed and void. And the Spirit, oh, there he comes, there's the other guy, the Spirit. The same Spirit is the sevenfold Spirit. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the water. And God said, let there be light. It wasn't the light that we know about. This was the light of the world. So I've got the Father, I've got the Holy Spirit, and I've got the Son. All three of them. What do you call that? I would call that a trinity. For those that don't believe in a trinity, you've got some problems. You're going to have some things to deal with because the Word of God declares it. So that's a code right there. We just broke a code. It's a coded book. Without Old Testament knowledge, you're not going to be able to understand. You're just going to read it for face value, and that's going to be it. And you, and you just won't understand it. It's the difference between reading a love letter and knowing the author who wrote the love letter, and knowing their heart, and actually being able to look inside of them to see everything that went on in them while they wrote the letter. It's a big difference. I want to go over to Isaiah 11. Let's look at the seven spirits of God. Because there's going, I don't understand. There's seven spirits of God. No, there's not seven. There's not seven Holy Spirits. There was one Holy Spirit. But I want to go to Isaiah 11. Because in Isaiah chapter 11, again, Old Testament, you will find a lot of pages in this book. You will find the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. We see in another place, we're going to see seven fires before the throne. Same thing. There's not seven Holy Spirits, there's just one, but there's seven different uh, aspects, uh, ingredients, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. So it goes like this in Isaiah chapter 11. I'm going to start at verse 1. There shall come forth a rod. This word rod just happens to be a masculine Hebrew word. So we're talking about a man, not a woman. There shall come forth a rod from the stem, the gaze on Greek, on Hebrew, I'm sorry, from the stock of Jesse. Now Jesse was from the tribe of Judah. And Judah was a powerful tribe until 586, and Nebuchadnezzar came in and cut that tree down. He felled that tree, Judah. The powerful tree of Judah was cut down and felled, and all that was left was a stump. And out of that stump that was felled grew a rod, a stem. We're going to see who it is. And the branch, this word branch, 
Very interesting word in Hebrew, netzer, N-E-T-Z-E-R, netzer. And you can write it in your Bible, write it in your Bible, it's okay. God isn't going to get mad at you for it. Netzer, just happens that that word's real close to netzerim, netzerim. I didn't write this, I'm just sharing it. And a branch shall grow out of his roots, not out of its roots, out of his root. This is a his, this is a him. This has to do with a person, not a tree and a stump. Everything's changing now. Now, what's coming out of this stump, this, this netzer, netzerim? Let's see. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. You remember in Isaiah 61, again, Old Testament, 1 and 2, Jesus went up as a visiting rabbi to the temple on Shabbos, on the Sabbath. And the visiting rabbi, tradition was that you had the visiting rabbi come and read out the scroll of law. What did he write? What did he do? He opened up the scroll of the law to Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and he preached about himself. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And it says the people were amazed until he got to the place where he said, and today it's fulfilled. I'm the Messiah and I just showed up. That's when they got upset. But up until then, they were good to go. Oh, this is rabbi can really, my God, he can preach. Boy, we got to have him next shots. Until he got to that, <laughs> to that one verse. And that was the end of him. Uh, for that uh, synagogue. But it said, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That is the first spirit of the sevenfold spirit, sevenfold ministry. Not seven spirits, it's sevenfold. That's the first part. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And that word Lord is Yahweh, Old Testament. The Spirit of the Old Testament Yahweh is upon me. The spirit there in Hebrew is ruach, R-U-A-C-H, ruach. I promised you Hebrew and Greek, ruach. What is that, what is, what's the Greek word? Pneuma, which we just talked about in the New Testament, see? They can't get away from it. The truth is the truth. We have to remember now, everything, every single word, every single word, every single letter in this book not one of those things is trivial to God. They are of the highest importance. Every letter, every word, every number, even the spaces in between the words. The rabbis used to say that when the Moshiach comes, when the Messiah comes, he's going to be able to reveal all of it, even what the spaces between the words are. So nothing is trivial. There are people who say, well, I don't need to read that. It's trivial. You have no idea what you're talking about. If somebody wrote you a love letter, you would, you would, you would, you would drink up every letter of a love letter. You wouldn't say, oh, in? Oh, in is a trivial word. What about win? You take the word in out of there and it's trivial, then she's not in love with you. She's love with you. Well, what kind of sense does that make? You see, so. Nothing is trivial in this book. Every single letter and number, I want you to get that because that's how important it is. That's why we don't want to skip over something because, God, this is boring. When we're done with this book, which hopefully by then the rapture will come, uh, we'll study names in the Old Testament. It's a plan. It's a program. Every single name. They could put you to sleep unless you understand what every single word in the Old Testament and the New Testament, what the words mean, what they represent. It's the plan of God. We're going to do that sometime. God willing. So number one, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And it did. The Spirit of God the Father was on the Son. Remember when he came up out of the water? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Spirit of the Lord came down. Number two, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of wisdom. 
In the Hebrew, we call it chokmah. I talked about it before. You got to get like a hairball. <laughs> Try and get rid of it. Chokmah, C H O C H M A H. Chokmah. What does it mean? It doesn't mean wisdom, it means God's wisdom. And God's wisdom, Jesus had his Father's wisdom. The spirit of wisdom. This is all resting upon the Messiah. That's the second fire. That's the second fold of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of wisdom. Third one, understanding. A little Hebrew word, bina, B-I-N-A-H, bina. And it doesn't mean to understand something. It means heavenly discernment. Heavenly discernment. In fact, if you take it in its most literal sense, the word understanding here means to have a sharp sense of smell. That you can smell out a sin. That you can smell out something wrong. That you can smell out a lie. That when the enemy gives you a, 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 a half-truth, you can smell it that he's lying. It means a sharp sense of smell. You see, things are different once you start to get into the words and you look in the Old Testament and you start taking a look at what they really mean. But this is going to give me a whole different flavor when I go back to the book of Revelation and look at the second part of the Trinity, or the third part of the Trinity. We go first part, second part, third part. All three of them, if you were to take a jar, a mason jar with three different colored sand in, shake it up real good, and then look at it. That's what the Trinity is all about. You can't separate them. They're all intermingled, interconnected. You can't separate them. So the spirit of wisdom and understanding, we've gone through three so far. The spirit of counsel. Etia in Hebrew. E-T-E-A-H. E-T-E-A-H. Etia. And it means design. It doesn't mean just uh, to counsel somebody. But it means to design for a purpose. The Holy Spirit, one of, one of his job is to design God's purposes, is to design God's plan for us. And then give us the courage and the, the inner power and might to fulfill it. Because we can do nothing on our own. We are absolutely, totally, totally, incredibly, deplorably helpless without the Trinity. I can do things, but I can't accomplish anything. I can't fulfill the will of God on my own. I have to have an indwelling Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that knows what the Father wants. Yeah. You see, once we start looking at these things, oh my gosh, now I'm starting to get an understanding of the Trinity. Let's go on. The spirit of counsel and might. Gevura in Hebrew, G-E-V-U-R-A-H. This is where we get, and we've heard his name before, El Gevur, the mighty warrior God. The spirit of counsel and might. Gevura, this means God's strength. This doesn't mean being strong like Samson. This means God's strength. Samson was strong, but where did his strength come from? Didn't come from eating his Cheerios. Didn't come from eating his Millbrook bread. Did your body 12 ways. Didn't come from that. It came from God. As long as he kept his covenant, his Nazarite covenant with Jehovah. He didn't cut his hair. He didn't do his other things. He had the Geborah. He had the might of God living in him. That's how he killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ant. That's how he carried the big, big, uh, several ton doors off and, and walked with them. Because he had that kind of might. But this might is the strength of God. It's not just physical power, it's the strength of God. It takes the strength of God to stand up against tribulation, to stand up against uh, those things that the enemy would want us to do. We can't fight with the enemy, unless we have an indwelling Holy Spirit who will empower us not to sin. We need the strength of God. That's what this is. Now, part of the reason Jesus didn't sin is because he had the Gura. 
He had the strength. His father's strength was in him. In fact, he said, I can do nothing on my own. I can achieve nothing on my own. This is Jesus. This is the, this is the second person of the Trinity with a flesh on. He says, I can do nothing on my own. I, can't, I, I don't do anything on my own. I don't say anything unless my father tells me. I don't go anywhere unless the father directs me. My strength comes from my God. That's what he said. How did he get through Calvary? Couldn't have done it on his own, although he was in excellent shape. He did it because he had the strength of his father in him, carrying through to fulfill the purposes of God, so that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He gave us in us. It takes the strength of God to do that. Next one, the spirit of knowledge. Little, little Hebrew word, da'at. Easy one to write, D-A-A-T, da'at. And it means the purposes of God. Knowledge is just not this. Acquired knowledge is okay, but there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge comes from what I can get from books and teaching. Wisdom comes from on high. There's a difference. It's good to have both, but be careful. I know many, many, many who are extremely knowledgeable scholars, but they don't have the wisdom of God. They can give you the Hebrew and the Greek and give you all this stuff out of the Word of God, but when it comes to wisdom, dealing with people who have the wisdom but not the knowledge, and ask them a question that they can't understand, they walk away with their tail between their legs. It happens. I want both. And the fear of the Lord. That's the sevenfold. There is a sevenfold spirit uh, known as the Holy Spirit. The fear of the Lord. And this word fear means uh, awesomeness, reverence. We don't just worship God, we reverence His holiness. Unfortunately, we're in a place in the 21st century church we, where we reverence God, we reverence Him only when He does stuff for us. But He's always, and always will be, the God of very God. Always holy. And there is none like Him. So let's go back to the revelation of Jesus Christ here. Let's go back to uh, the seven spirits. Well, so far we've looked at the Father and we looked at the Holy Spirit. Now let's look at Jesus. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, he was faithful witness. This is the guy who cannot lie. Jesus never lied. The faithful witness, who was alive, incarnate, alive, walked the earth, and the firstborn from the dead. I want to look at this word firstborn for a second. This word firstborn is prototypos. And it means the origin of. There's two words that we find in the Bible. One of them, a certain denomination, which I'm not going to name, says that this word here, prototypos, the origin of life, is actually that he wasn't the origin of life, he was prototypistos. I don't want to go into all the Greek stuff. The word here is prototakos. They put the word in as prototakos, and that means that he was begotten and that he wasn't the origin of life. And that's a lie from the devil. This is a firstborn from the dead. Firstborn, of course, we just said has to do with resurrection. He is the firstborn from the dead, and then we come up right behind him. And then the day is coming when it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, and God himself shall come down with a shout, with the voice of the archangel Michael, with the trump of God, and they which are dead in Christ shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Why can he do that? Because he's the first one. He was the first one, and he's going to bring the rest. We who remain and are alive shall be caught up. 
up to meet him in the air to be with him forever. Where he goes, we go. Praise God. What a program. Oh, I can't wait for that. I'm getting tired of this one, honey. I could use a new one. And the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Where does he rule over the kings of the earth? He rules from his throne. This is his ascension and sitting on the right hand of God the Father. There is another code. So we have the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son. Now, here's the next thing I want to share with you. There's past, present, and future in this code. In these codes, watch how it works. He who is, and who was, and who is to come. We got it. He who was in the past, he who is the I am, present, and he who is to come. Coming back to the future, past, present, future. Let's go on with another one. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, when he was walking the earth, he was the faithful witness. And the firstborn from the dead. And then he came to the place where he died. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. Future. Past, present, future. Our salvation is the same. Our salvation is past, present, future. We were saved from the penalty of sin in the past. We are currently being saved from the power of sin in the present. And then in the future, when we're removed from this earth, we will be, be removed from the presence of sin, from the penalty in the past, the power is saving us now, and when we're removed, you see, past, present, and future. We've got all of these triads all through the, just the first chapter, and it opens up the whole thing. Wide open, it flails it wide open. This is an absolutely amazing book with all kinds of codes that we can break and reveal if we know where to go. That's why many won't teach it because they don't know where to go. Here's another one. Let's go on. To him who loved us, this word loved in Greek is agapanti, A-G-A-P-O-N-T-I. You can write that in your Bible, it's okay. A-G-A-P-O-N-T-I, agapanti. And it doesn't mean who loved us. It means who loves us. And it's continuous in the earth. It's continuous. He who loved us and who washed us, that word washes, is continually washing. That's in the present. We are continually being washed by the blood of Jesus. Minute by minute, moment by moment, day by day, hour by hour, for our lives on this earth, we are washed. We're continually washed in the blood of Jesus. Who washes us? The Holy Spirit constantly washes us. You can imagine yourself in a bath of the blood of Jesus constantly being washed. Every thought, every word, every action, everything is being washed in the blood of Jesus. To him who loved us, he loved us in the past so much that he went to the cross and died for us even while we hated him. But he washes us continually in the present. And from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God. That's in the future. In him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see the past, present, and future there? He loved us in the past, died on the cross for us. In the present, he washes us in his blood. And our future is being kings and priests. Now here's the thing about kings and priests. In the Old Testament, you couldn't be a king and a priest. A couple people tried it and they got in big trouble. You were either a king from the tribe of Judah, or you were a priest from Levi. Only a couple of people we have in the Word of God who are both priests and kings. One of them we find in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 7, and his name is Melchizedek. He was a priest and a king. After, and Jesus is called after the order of Melchizedek in Hebrews 7. Back in the Old Testament, 
we find him, oh, we're going back to the Old Testament again to understand him. In the Old Testament, we find him, I think in Genesis 14. We find Melchizedek showing up, and he is a priest and a king. He, those are the only two, Jesus and Melchizedek. But Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek. But here's the thing. We are going to be made priests and kings forever. Why? How can we be both? Because we are in Christ and he made us so. And that's what we are going to be. As he is in heaven, so shall we be. That's what the word of God explains. So we're going to, not just going to be, and we've got to stop thinking this way. We've got to stop thinking so small about who we are. We are not just believers on the earth. We're way, way above that. We are chosen. We're called. We're chosen. And we're going to end up sitting on the throne with Jesus, ruling and reigning with him. We're going to be priests and kings too. Both of them together. Because what he is, who he is, we shall be also. Not because we earned it. But because he decided to do it that way, praise his holy name. So we got through, this is pretty good. We got through five verses already. I'm sorry, we went through six verses, praise God, already. So then I, I want you to go back and take a look at this, take a look at your notes, and I would like you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the depth of these six verses. And then write it down in a journal. And keep the journal. And whenever the Holy, whenever the Holy Spirit gives you a, a word or a thought, get your journal and write it down. Or write it in your Bible. So that you can see how the Holy Spirit is, is, is um, teaching you and empowering you with the depth of Christ. And who he is, and what this is all about. This is the most magnificent book ever, ever written. Nothing like the book of Revelation. No book will ever come close to this. Why? Because it's a revelation of God. So, um, that's going to do it for this session. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, in the next session, we're going to go on and go even deeper. Amen? Praise the Lord.